W. Stein holds a Bachelor's of Science from the University of Arizona. She is best known for her award-winning documentary film, Travis, the true story about Tra Travis Walton, uh, about the very famous story about Travis Walton, abduction 1975. She has been a guest speaker here and at other conferences several times, and we are delighted to have her back again. Jennifer's contributions to the UFO field are numerous. She's the founder of Mainline MUFON, a Pennsylvania chapter of the Mutual UFO Network, where she served as state section director for 20 years. Jennifer produced 10 years of public programming on anomalous subjects for her public access television network in the Philadelphia suburbs and was instrumental in the organization, funding, and development of MUFON Television, which is winning well, very well today. Today she serves as state section director of Sedona, Arizona. Part of Jennifer's uh, bucket list was to have traveled to many of the ancient places written about by people like Zachariah Sitchin, who was a good friend of hers, Graham Hancock, Eric Von Daniken, and Robert Shaw. The Sacred Valley of Peru was one of these sites. Today she will be speaking about the amazing architecture of the Sacred Valley of Peru. Enjoy your talk and give her a big welcome. Thank you, thank you. So I understand I have about one hour, so I'm actually going to time myself so in respect to the next uh, speaker. So I am going to be speaking about unusual architecture that follows what's called the Orobamba River, and this is where it is on the map of Peru. It is a, a very beautiful river valley, as many, as you know, are, and I'm going to see how successful I am at advancing the slide. Let's see. There we go. So this is a, a close-up of the Orobamba River here, and the sites I'm going to be discussing are a site in Cusco, right in the heart of Cusco, called Coricancha. I'm also going to be dis discussing another site called Saxawama. I may not be pronouncing that 100% correct. Then I'll also be discussing a site called Oleante Tambo here and Machu Picchu here. But you can see the Sacred River Valley, all of these circles and dots are additional sites that have very interesting megalithic architecture. So this is a spattering. If you ever decide you want to do something very interesting that's less expensive and less complicated than going to, say, Egypt to see the pyramids, I encourage you to go to Peru. Um, it is a uh, very easy country to travel in. They're very friendly, and the sole is three to one American dollar, so your money goes quite far. So again, these are the sites I'm going to be discussing Saxawama, which many of you have seen videos and pictures of, Oleante Tambo, which sits high, high on top of a, uh, a cliff with all these terraced garden areas, and there's a megalithic structure here at the top that looks down over the river valley, Machu Picchu right here, which is way on the top of a mountain, and this is the inside of a Spanish church called the Coricancha. And it was uh, built by um, some ancient culture, pre-Columbian culture. We do not know who, but it was not built by the Incas. So most of you know Peru was conquered by the Spanish in the, the, between the 1530s and the 1540s. A uh, conquistador named Pizarro conquered most of Peru and Bolivia. He even enslaved the Bolivians and um, made them mine silver and took the silver uh, that was in uh, Bolivia at the time and brought it back to Spain. And in fact, I am wearing here a coin necklace printed by the Spanish in 1652 when they enslaved the local Bolivians and printed their own money in Bolivia. <laughs> 
um, jumping ahead. This is a, a typical piazza you can see in the heart of Cusco with uh, lots of Spanish architecture. So you think you're in uh, uh, Paris or you know some other major city like Barcelona or something in parts of uh, Cusco and Peru. This is, uh, I think, a, a plaza in Lima, but there are similar ones in Cusco as well. And this is another picture of the typical Spanish architecture and the plazas and piazzas that uh, are in the city central. So that's not unusual architecture, but this is. So this is in the heart of Cusco, and it's just a typical building, but the base of it, this wall here is very interestingly finely cut stones, which are on a slight angle, a very slight angle inward. So they're, the walls are wider and thicker at the bottom and thinner and narrower at the top, and all the stones are uh, proportioned as well. The stones on the bottom are larger and thicker, and they get smaller and smaller and smaller smaller in a very interesting algorithmic way. So if you're a mathematician, you could literally calculate how each layer of stone is proportionally uh, made smaller. You also cannot put a piece of a pin or a credit card or a, a paper clip between these stone blocks. And these stone blocks have just been incorporated into the architecture now of Peru. So you see this in many, many cases. Here is another example of it. Can you see how the wall is leaning? leaning in slightly, and how the stones are proportionally each different being smaller at the top. This was made by some pre-Columbian culture, not the Incas. And some of these structures were around at the time of the, uh, the Inca king who was uh, in charge in Cusco. There were two Inca brothers, just a brief story of uh, Inca history. There were two brothers. One um, lived in the northern edge of the Inca empire in what is now called Quito, and he was the king of that regional area. And his other slightly older brother was in charge of what is now, we might say, Peru or the lower Inca. Inca Empire, and they were sort of at war with one another. And it's only because they were most likely at war with one another that Pizarro's men were actually able to cut a deal with the Inca king up in um, the northern, uh, you know, Quito area, and overthrow and arrest and capture the king that was in charge of Cusco. And then eventually they um, basically uh, imprisoned and murdered both of these brothers and collected all the gold and silver as ransom, trying, saying to the Inca people, we'll let your king go if you bring us all your gold and silver, which they did. And then they just confiscated it and killed the king. That was the, uh, the Spanish history there. Jumping forward, I mentioned uh, a Spanish church which was built in the heart of Cusco. This is called the Church of Santo Domingo. So this is the Spanish church that was built. Hopefully you can hear me when I turn my head sideways, so I'll just turn the mic. And this wall here is not part of the Spanish architecture. This is part of the original structures that were pre-Columbian and were in place when the Spanish arrived. Um, this is a model, you can see, of that wall when you go into the Spanish church, which is now a museum. And there were four buildings that were also inside this exterior wall. This was the heart of the ancient pre-Columbian culture that was discovered by the Incas and preserved and protected. And it was also, I believe, the home of the king. And there was a courtyard here full, filled with gold figurines. We know some of this history because it was recorded by the uh, priest that traveled with Pizarro and his men. And in fact, they spent a lot of time time with the Inca king as well in the prison cells and recorded some of their history and then confiscated some of their books. Most of them were burned and discarded as so were uh, the books in the Mayan and Aztec uh, are, uh, cultures. But they had books similar to the Aztecs and the Mayans where they were picture books and they didn't really have um, articulated writing uh, but they did have a series of record keeping with knots and things like this and what we might call graphic novels, novels uh, that depicted their history. But this courtyard was filled with gold figurines of animals and the uh, conquistadors collected all of that and melted down all of those gold figurines. 
This is another drawing um, done in the museum, which depicts the city that was built at that time when Pizarro's men conquered it. And this is the Cori Concha, or the heart of the city here. And there was a well in the heart of the city with four directional like pathways that led out from it, denoting northwest, south, and east. And I will be showing you that. Now, what the conquistadors did, what the Spanish church did, is they literally built their structure over top of these central buildings, leaving the exterior wall here because they couldn't quite figure out how to build the church that large. But they built the church right on top of these, completely concealing them but incorporating them into the building. And they did that three times throughout history because um, this is an earthquake-prone area and the church uh, collapsed uh, through three times because of earthquake and three times it was rebuilt, as you will see in my presentation. So this, um, none of these, I'll go back, none of these original structures here collapsed and I will tell you why, because they built, they were built with earthquake prevention architecture designs in place, which I will try to give you a, an influence and show you how. But these were completely concealed as I will show you. So this is that central courtyard with the well that still stands today and this is the central courtyard. Over here are the Inca buildings, which the last time there was an earthquake, the local Quechuan people demanded that the city of Cusco and the, the country no longer cover these buildings over and they open it as a museum and the church could expand in the front but they wanted this open as a museum and they wanted to honor their ancient ancestors. So uh, they rebuilt the church leaving these structures free as you will see in some of my pictures. This was one of the earlier um, churches that was built. This was the second one that was built. And here are some of the Franciscan priests who were there. This is a picture from around the 1950s or before. And this is the central courtyard, and they are standing in front of the well. You, can't, you can see it right back here. But they are standing in front of a well, which is in the center of this courtyard. And this whole building collapsed in 1952. And when it did, they did not rebuild it the same way. This is what they rebuilt. Here's the well. And they exposed the uh, indigenous uh, or pre-Columbian ancient cultural buildings that were there. And you'll begin to start seeing. Here's another picture of that. And you can see the four areas denoted in the brickwork in that central courtyard denoting north, east, south, and west. In fact, if you walk around there with dowsing rods, your dowsing rods ping. So there's definitely something going on with ley lines here. So this is a view looking out into the courtyard that we were just looking at, and here is the wall structure of one of these original pre-Columbian structures. They are wider at the bottom, narrower at the top, and I'll give you other pictures of this so you can see how dramatic and how complicated these structures are. Uh, you can see the size of the blocks on the bottom as they go up. The doorways all have very distinct, interesting shapes. Wider at the bottom, narrower at the top. The other thing that is reported in the um, Spanish history is that these particular structures had silver and gold um, inside the walls of these structures, nailed to the walls. So these rooms inside what's called the Cori Concha had silver and gold, and we do not know for what specific reason uh, that was there, but um, the Spanish quickly removed it, melted it, and sent it back to Spain because, of course, they were traveling on Isabella's jewel money, and they needed to, you know, come back to Spain with... Um, with uh, proceeds. This is just me standing there pointing out the difference between some of the pre-Columbian walls. One was taken apart in the last building, and here is the new church behind it, <laughs> and here is some of the pre-Inca block walls. You can see how larger, smaller, smaller, and smaller the construction was. That's the overlap of the two structures. 
these, when they, when they took apart one of the structures, they discovered that these balls existed underneath the structure. That is why, most likely, these original uh, pre-Columbian structures did not collapse in the three major earthquakes that destroyed the Catholic Church and collapsed the church on top of them. But uh, they were balls found, and this used to be on display, but they have since removed it. It's no longer there. I've made a couple different trips to Peru. Here's another picture of these structures. And here is the courtyard out here. So you can walk around the courtyard and see them on one side of the courtyard and the other. And these are like tall glass windows where you're sort of seeing reflection of the church in the tall glass windows. But that lets in natural light. Um, so you can see these structures well. Um, here is another view of that walkway, the light coming in from the open windows. Here's a doorway going into one of these structures. You can see the angled wall. Here is a group of us standing inside one of these structures. Can you see how the wall is slightly angled? It's a three degree angle, both this wall and this wall. And this window lines up with five other windows and other structures that are there that would let the sun come through on the vernal equinox, which would hit a back wall in one of the structures and most likely illuminate some significant piece of silver or artwork or some probably stone that has since been removed that was a marker stone because you see this again and again and again in ancient cultures that they are built with alignments to the vernal equinoxes usually having something to do with probably planting seasons or uh, you know marking a one year period of time. Here are the nail holes. Can you see them as I'm kind of moving my finger actually that's Brian Forrester some of you may know who he is and he's pointing out the nail holes here where the Spanish took off the gold you can also see remnants of white paint here. I'll describe that in a minute. I'd also like to point out every single stone has a beveled edge around it. I think I have closer pictures of that. Here's again the nail holes here. Everywhere where a stone is connected to another stone, there is a slight beveled edge. Let's see, can I go forward? Here's again another picture of that. And the open uh, window area where light comes through five different windows all lining up. This is an artist representation of what is believed it looked like from some of the notes done by the uh, Franciscan priest that traveled with Pizarro. Uh, it's sort of a, from their verbal descriptions and their written descriptions in Spanish, this was uh, recreated. And here is a close-up. I don't know if you can see this slight beveled edge here, all along these fine, fine, fine little marks here and these fine, fine, fine little lines here. That makes the stone thinner and then thicker on the surface where it's connected. And of course, you cannot put a pin or a credit card or a paper clip in between these stones. Now, this is me videotaping over some of my girlfriend's heads. You see the remnant of white paint here? The Spanish had completely stuccoed over these walls and painted them, much like this, so that the uh, Peruvians who lived through the 16th, 17th, 18th, and most of the 19th century really had no idea that these structures were here, except when there was an earthquake and then the, uh, you know, the reconstruction crew would find them and then they realized that they matched other structures in other parts of Peru and then they raised enough ruckus to open this museum. If, if it meant money for the local government, then they decided to do it. And finally, the the, uh, you know, the Catholic Church lost and the uh, local um, uh, archaeological society won and they reconstructed these, uh, the church around it, opening this for a museum. So these are two of the structures right next to each other. It's a hallway that leads out to the courtyard. This is the central courtyard, why it's so bright. And these are two of the wall structures of two of the heart of the Cori Concha buildings. This is the window and you can see it matches is the same shape as the doorways. You see this, this shape, wider at the bottom, narrower at the top, repeated again and again and again. It's a form of sacred architecture or sacred geometry, and it has a resonant shape. Um, I'll, if I have time and I remember, I'll tell you a short story about a group of us toning into these at the top of Machu Picchu, because these exist at Machu Picchu as well. 
so this is just the shape. We don't know what purpose they serve. They obviously didn't put candles in them because there's no burn marks or residue of anything at the top, but what the shape was for, we don't know. It may have had something to do with sound resonance. Here's the lineup of all the windows, of all the structures that line up perfectly, and that before the church was built through that area, that open window, these are three, three windows you can see through. Um, but before the church was built, the vernal equinox sunrise would come right through these windows. Now, there are other structures, we have no idea what they mean, but you can see the complicated stonework. Was this some sort of gear or lever or lock or bolt? It looks like a bank vault to me, if you ask me. I look at that and say, that's highly sophisticated um, carving of stone. And this is balsat stone. This is not volcanic rock. This is stone which is very, very hard and very, very dense. So even to carve that, some engineers engineers would say you need a diamond bit to, to carve it. Uh, so it's quite uh, sophisticated. And although these are just blocks they put on display, they don't know how they went together. Um, from the last and third earthquake, they just kind of reconstructed what they thought went together. And they have a lot of random stones around in the back of the museum. And it's gotten added to. I call it the graveyard. It's in the back of the church. This was a picture I took in 2004. And these are like different types of stones that get dug up when they're doing, um, say, sewer work or road construction work or building construction in Cusco. And they come across these stones and they think, oh my God, you know, what's this? It's, a, you know, and they have to dig it out to build a foundation and they just bring it over to the church and dump it. And this has gotten to be, you know, a huge graveyard now. And there's more stones in it like this. Doesn't this look like some sort of toilet or piping or water piping or something? And it's balsa. And it's perfectly carved. It's like, <laughs> you know, my, my little noodle goes off. That's not my alarm, so don't worry. Now, this is Brian Forrester showing us one of these stones that was just delivered into this graveyard of stones in the back of the church. He is holding a flashlight in the back of this stone right here. And halfway through this block, which is, say, yay big, like this, like this, about this high, right, quite large. There is a hole drilled through the stone, which changes its depth and dimension halfway through the stone. Are there any plumbers here who understand compression of water and uh, piping and the different size of pipes adds a higher level of pressure to water traveling through it? So this was actually some sort of pressure gauge that would increase the pressure in water tunneling through that. And it is finely cut on the inside, looking like it was uh, manufactured with some sort of diamond bit. So, you know, halfway through this, the, the, the hole is big and then it condenses down to be quite small. This is a close-up picture of it. You can see right here, midway through the stone, the, the hole uh, gets thinner or smaller. So this is not Incan architecture. This is pre-Columbian, and we do not know who built it. Lots of things like this, lots of stones like this around. Now, we often call this a key cut, and in many cases, you can find structures in um, certainly other countries, also in Peru in places, where that was filled with metal early form of iron. So there would be two stones next to each other and there would be metal poured in here which would then solidify and it would hold the stones together in the event of an earthquake, which were prolific through many centuries in this area. Here are other random stones in this um, graveyard of stones in the back of the Santa Domingo Church. Some more certainly looks like a water system to me, a very sophisticated one. There are other stones which don't make sense. This reminds me of what's the, called the hitching post of the sun, which is at the top of Machu Picchu, and I will share that with you um, if I get to it. So now we're on to the second site. This is a site called Saksawama. This is a uh, magnificent plateau that sits above the city of Cusco, so you can look down from Saksawama and see the city of Cusco out behind you. And these stones are uh, really 
enormously huge. Also, the same type of beveling exists. Where one stone meets another, the stone edges are beveled in and then kind of pop out and get bigger. And these stones also don't have, they aren't perfect squares. A lot of times they jut up and they're kind of like angled edges and they are huge. They're also built with a similar proportional geometry like I described before. Saksawama is a zigzag wall and it's three walls, one on top of another, which like you would imagine like a wedding cake or a birthday cake, you know, the big ones bigger on the bottom and then they get smaller and smaller. So there are three stacked walls that stand on top of one another, filled in on a cliff or on a hill. And you'll begin to see these here. And I think this is actually a little aerial video I can show you. So look at this zigzag wall here and the megalithic stones. And then there's a stairway up to the second plateau, then a stairway up to the third plateau, then a stairway up to the top where there are some very interesting remnants of structures, but we don't know exactly what they are. So you can see how this is larger, smaller, and smaller. It's very proportioned, much like Disneyland is, if you have ever gone to Disneyland or Disney World, and the, the, the ground levels are human size, but the upper levels are proportioned smaller, so they, they kind of look cute and petite, and you know everything is custom-sized. Let me see if this video will play. It's an audio-free video, but it gives you an aerial view of this wall of Saksawama here. This is another structure at the top of Saksawama um, that's over here. It looks like a round ball court. This this is at the top of these, these three tiered birthday cake walls and we don't know what this is or what purpose it served and it's never been reconstructed and there's no history of it. Again, here's a view of the three walls looking down over this plaza and then there's a high hill on the other side. This is looking out at the city of Cusco, that round amphitheater, a big hill cliff, this large plaza, the three stacked stone walls and what's left on the top. Saksawama is a huge megalithic site. It's, uh, we don't have enough time to go into it, but there that gives you the perspective of the city of Cusco below it. And these are some of my pictures as we walk down from the adjacent hill down and across this green plaza or piazza or just you know green open field and then up into some of these structures. Um, I think this, this might be a quick little video I did showing you what this zigzag wall looks like. And I imagine that this was some sort of uh, defense uh, mechanism put in place with a zigzag wall like that. And there probably was some sort of, you know, major hub or structure up here, probably for a king of some sort. And this adjacent cliff, which looks down on this grassy area, has some very interesting cutouts on it like this. <laughs> what is this? It's just clearly cut out stones where their chairs put in place here with these steps. Was this where a king and queen sat with their entourage behind them? This is some of the suspected um, ideas of what this served. But these are perfectly cut stones. When I was with Brian Forrester, a lot of times he was standing there measuring them with a, uh, with a, with a T-bar and things like that. They're perfectly level. <laughs> he, would, he travels with a leveler and a T-bar and all sorts of things. So this is again looking at the proportional size. You can see how big they are in relation to people. Here's a, there's a person to the left up here, right here. So you can see this is the upper wall, this is the lower wall, and someone has walked up the flight of stairs and they are on the second level. So these are gigantic stones and they have many faceted ways in which they go together. Not all the stones, of course, are square cut. And um, the way they are faceted together without your ability to stick a pin or a credit card or anything in between them, except in some cases of earthquake where some of the stones have separated and then you can see in and you can see how perfectly flat they, they were carved or etched to put them together and it's really still unclear how this was built. 
and you can hear, you can see the beveling. Do you see how uh, this is um, a narrowed edge that kind of collapses in and then bulks back out with the majority of the stone? Here is a good beveled edge here. So wherever the stones are fit together, they are beveled. Quite interesting. Here is me with a, a, a quick interesting side note. I'm on this tour in 2004, and we pick up a tour guide in the city of Cusco, and there's about 15 of us on this trip, and he has broken English, and I'm just sitting alone on the bus, and he sits down to, with me, and he says um, in his broken English, are you interested in UFOs? And I like, I, lit I had bangs at the time. I literally picked up my bangs. I said, is it written on my forehead? <laughs> like, you know, how did you know that? He was just psyched. And, and knew he could talk to me. He leads trips now to sites where you take donkeys, you're on a four-day donkey ride or bike ride um, or a little moped ride up part of the Inca Trail to another site like Machu Picchu, which is not well known. And you camp there and you see UFOs constantly all night. And he takes people there. His name is Juan. So maybe one day I will go back. Here's from one of the upper ledges looking down so you can see the top of these uh, zigzagged walls. This structure is mysterious. It's, we looked at it from the air. It's a foundation, possibly, of a building. We don't know what it was. It's what's left of it here today. And there are, at the top of Saksiwama, there are many of these rounded rooms. And look at these blocks, just, they toppled out from the wall over here. I look at this and say, my goodness, was it a swimming pool? Was it, uh, was it another building? Was it a church? Was it a sanctuary? It wasn't completely round, but it had a rounded wall to it. And this is like a ballpark. I look at this and I think, this reminds me of some of the Roman um, amphitheaters that they used to build. It had tiered seating on one side, it was completely round. Now the Incas reconstructed this, so this has both architectures in it. Wherever you see small stones that are about the size I could hold in my fist, and they're put together with mortar, with, you know, mud and hay and things like that, that's Incan. And it's clear that we know that that's Incan. So we are now moving on to the third site, which is called Oliente Tambo. So we're moving down the Orobamba River Valley, we're going down in elevation, and we're moving closer to Machu Picchu. Um, Oliente Tambo is a structure on the top of a mountain cliff, and we're going to be looking at some of these megalithic stones up here. But before we get there, you have to go through, uh, I'll just back up one, one slide, sorry. You have to go through a, um, a town plaza, so you buy some of the local artists' goods and wares and jewelry. And you pay your fee and go through a doorway here, and then you get out into a, a courtyard. This is what it looks like from the air. Um, so this is that wall I was showing you before. This is buses in the central plaza where you can shop and buy, you know, weavings and uh, water bottle carriers. And this is the town of Oliente Tambo. And these are tiered structures which were most likely put in for farming. If you are going to farm in a mountainous region in high elevation, if you have stone terrace walls like this, it makes it flat for you to farm. And the stones heat up so that when you're in colder temperatures, the stones hold the heat for the soil so that the seeds can germinate. It's also quite brilliant that if you're farming in an area like this, water runoff from the top terrace runs down through the various terraces. And uh, plus there's also water canals from the top of the mountain that brought water down to different terraces. So they had well positioned themselves in, a, in an area strategic for visual defense and for farming, quite interestingly. And these walls were built by the Inca culture, and you'll see that shortly. One of the authors that I discovered while I was in Peru is an author that came to the conclusion that all of the structures in Peru, all of the ancient sites, had a animal motif that you could see from the air, much like the Nazca lines. So I'll go back to the next slide, and you can see roughly where the tearing looked like the, say, hair or the sides of a llama with its baby. I'll go back once more and show it to you. This is the baby face in here, and there's more structure that goes around the side. I don't know if that's really true.
through or not, but here is the piazza you walk through in the doorway to come into the site. And this is a better description, laying it out for you. So this is the piazza you walk through. Once you get through that doorway, this is what you see. Here are the terraced walls, that, and you must walk up a series of steps very, very, very high. And it's difficult to do because you're in high elevation. You're probably at about eight or 9,000 feet here. And when you get up to the top, you're probably around uh, maybe close to 10. So um, this is the walkway, and there are these very unusual stones, I'll point out here, that have fallen probably in the past from above. This is an unusual wall, probably pre-Columbian, but these walls here, as you will see, I'll, I'll give you close-up pictures, those are Inca walls. Well, I don't know if you can see this. This looks like an I-beam. This kind of looks like a step. We'll go in a little closer. You can see them. This is one of our friends walking up. We stood here and talked about these stones. Like, what the heck is that? <laughs> it's probably a stairway or doorway entrance, entrance into some kind of structure. This stone toppled from the top, most likely, and broke apart. Uh, I'm standing here sweating already, taking off my shirt. This was one of our tour guides, and this is a very unusual I-beam behind us. I don't know if you can see it, but it's cut out here and here. You can see how tall it is based on the size of my body standing there, holding my arms up. And um, it's, this is the back of the stone, and the front of it is here. So this is a split picture with the same stone photographed from the back or side and from the front. What purpose it served in these structures, I don't know. But look behind you, this is an Inca wall. These, this is constructed by the Incas. This type of structure is pre-Columbian, the pre-culture that was there in the past. Now we have started to walk up these terraced stairways with these Inca walls and these Inca garden patches. We're looking down on the bazaar, the, the plaza, and the entrance wall you have to come through. Now there's very interesting structures all along here. What I'm also pointing out is there is a face carved on the adjacent mountainside. People say this is Viracocha. There's this whole legend that this god named Viracocha arrived in Lake Titicaca and he brought agriculture and everything to the pre-Columbian cultures that are there. And he apparently was in Bolivia. He was also in Peru. It's all kind of legend carried over from the pre-Inca culture that the Incas knew about. Uh, this is also a drawing of what they believe he actually looked like, the same artist that thinks all the sites had animal um, figurines. This is a grain storage area that was created, carved out of solid rock up high in the mountains. So this is definitely a face, and the Spanish recorded shooting off its nose, just like they did the Sphinx. Interestingly, there's a crown at the top of his head. And guess what lights up on the first sun on the vernal equinox? The crown. Very interesting. Okay, jumping ahead. Now I'm going further and further up that terracing. I'm giving you a view looking back down at the piazza, the plaza where you can buy crafts, and you can walk up these terraced areas. And it's much higher up, so you stop and rest and catch your breath. And this is looking from um, an adjacent you know, hill. I walked around the site and took pictures looking back. This is where we're going to go next. There is a um, what's left of a remnants of a plaza, like a stage area possibly, at the top of this mountain site. And there are huge megalithic stones lying around up here that are as big as semis and weigh you know, 20 to 30 tons. And on the underside of them, they are as smooth as the granite countertop in your kitchen if you have one. So these are sort of the structures. As, the, as you get up to the top of this plaza, you see very interesting structures just like you saw at Saksawama, multifaceted stones. And the orange color on them is a lichen. It is a moss, or sort of like a moss, that grows, but it takes like many hundreds of years for it to grow. So you can often, some people say you can date the stone by the amount of lichen that is growing on it. And it's very hard to scrape off and chip off. Um, 
moving forward, hopefully. There we go. So you can see some of these interesting stone walls, how they are constructed together. Again, each stone is mitered into the next stone, uh, or has a beveled edge where it goes together. And then there are these unusual knobs in places. We don't know what they mean. Here is a group of us leaning against a wall at the top because there's no guardrails. So if you fall, it's, yeah, this is not a trip as most places are in Peru for uh, you know, people who are not able-bodied or who lose their balance easily. Um, but we're leaning against the wall because we're all freaked out at the height <laughs> before we go up to the next level. Um, and uh, we're also kind of trying to meditate <laughs> a bit and figure out what, you know, who built this culture. Here is Inca construction. These are small handheld, you know, stones you can put into place with mortar. And this is the pre-Columbian wall construction. This is um, me standing in the doorway, but that's not the important aspect of the picture. I want you to notice the lintel stone here at the top, how perfect that is, and notice this stone right here. It makes a curved corner. So this stone fits together with that stone, but this stone holds it all together. So it's carved out after it's put in place, or maybe before it's put in place, and this is Inca reconstruction down here. So some of this, uh, you know, jiggles apart during some of the earthquakes, and then it gets re-put back together. Here's another picture of this cornerstone. You see this again and again and again in Peru, but I've also seen this right in front of the Sphinx, in the Sphinx Temple. There are stones like this smack in Egypt. You see this in Turkey. You see this in Bolivia. Um, you can see it in parts of Romania. You can see it in parts of Russia. There are complexes like this all over the world. But nobody's putting the pieces together of the pre-Inca architecture. I also saw construction like that in Easter Island. So here again, um, some of the natural rock, some of the walls built in here, and now we're going to start to look at the top of the structure, once we're on the top of it, going up. So here is sort of this, this plaza. Here are these terraced walls going down, or these terraced garden areas. So can you see the Inca construction here with small stones? Now, they did a beautiful job, and the Inca government, now I mean, I should say the Peruvian government, keeps it well maintained. But these are small stones put in place with mortar. And these type of stones and this type of stone at the top are certainly not. So here is Brian Forrester looking at a megalithic size, probably 30 ton piece of balsat, or gra it's granite. This is actually granite. The underside where they're touching is very, very smooth. I think I photographed it for you, maybe? No, I didn't. But this is uh, either granite or balsat. I'm not quite sure which. And I was goofing around because and, and when I was there in 2004, we could. So uh, this friend of mine, got, we did yoga on top of it. And here's our crew standing in front of what's called the, this, I think it's called the Wall of the Three Sisters or something like that, or the Six Sisters. These are solid stone panels that are flat. They're, they're wide, about as wide as my arms. They're about this thick. They're kind of slid into place and held together almost like you would a hardwood floor. I don't know if any of you are carpenters, if you've ever laid a hardwood floor and fit wood into one another, into the grooves as you lay the floor out. These panels are slid down in as solid stone pieces and are held in place by these other stones that fit them together. It's kind of complicated to explain, but maybe you can get the gist of it. And no one knows who built that wall or why, and it's, the, it's at the top of this plaza. It's quite confusing. Here's a better look at it. Um, so these are the fitted stones that kind of fit them together, wider at the bottom, narrower at the top. And this one happened to have a very interesting uh, design on it. You see again and again and again, but it is water eroded on this one side. Uh, this is probably from a magazine. It's the Wall of the Six Monoliths, that's what they call it. And I have photographed it from above. That's what it looks like close up. Here is the design and pattern that is carved on this wall. 
It's much like this pattern. It's almost identical to that pattern. I think that's a picture from Bolivia, but it's a similar pattern. And here is the fitting or the joicing or how they fit these stones together. So the big stones were sort of, one was put into place and then these fitted stones were added in and then this one was slid in being held by these stones. So these stones are sort of like eye beams, like small little eye pieces that would hold the stones in the front and the back, if that makes sense. Oh, I have a little video here for you, <laughs> filming down the wall, just to give you a sense. And again, you can't like slide a credit card in here. Um, you can't put a paper clip in there. And that's the base of the wall. Pardon? Yes, rocks are beveled too. Mm -hmm. And you can see a little bit of the design that's left over here. I will jump ahead. There isn't much more to this. This is, this is on the top of these stones, and people are on the plaza below. So you can see how thick these monoliths are, and these are the stones that fit them together. And this is a back wall here that's put in place. Quite amazing. And for some reason, there's a bit of a step here. And in many places, you can find key cuts. Uh, this is the edge of a stone here. I just wrote in the area which was not part of the stone. So there's a key cut to a large stone that probably fit to another stone at some point, but it's either been moved or it fell down in earthquake, and you can just see the key cut left. And in many cases, iron was found in those. And we think that of the iron culture as being probably much later than the pre-Columbian culture, but we don't know when and who built these stones. So take a look at these two stones right at the top here which have tumbled there's this is another wall here but these stones have tumbled to this place and been left there so long that um, you know you can't really understand their full size and here's a close-up of it smooth as can be on all sides perfectly key cut here's Brian Forrester measuring it you can see that it looks as smooth as granite it's a little video of him going along and measuring how perfectly square and flat it is. And then he gets, well, obviously this one's tumbled, so it's not level. But, uh, and this guy next to him is a geologist. We had Robert Schock on this trip with us as well. Um, you see all over the place uh, steps and things that look like seats, things with carved reliefs that pop out of them, and you wonder, what the heck? And then look at all these little stones underneath it. I think those were slid in to kind of prevent this from cracking, um, and it probably fell to this location and then was, uh, you know, reacclimated in place. But you see this again and again and again. There was also a graveyard of unusual stones around the corner, once you go all the way down these steps and you walk around the corner at Oliente Tambo. And I went around and started photographing these stones because they are all carved with these very interesting cuts. And you think, who did this and why? Let's see if it will jump ahead for me. I must not be pointing this correctly. Come on. Come on. There it goes, thank you. So look at the, I mean, th I don't know if these stones went together originally, but there's tons of these things lying around at the bottom of Oliente Tambo, sort of around the corner. So I started exploring all these uh, stones and photographing them. And there are a number of things like this, where there is an underwater, man-made, you know, small aqueduct of some sort that brings water out to solid base, carved out, perfectly shaped rectangles that have little drain holes that are rounded on the side that then take the water further underground and further out into other terraced areas. So there was a series of these... Um, springs, the spring water, we can denote the water by looking at it, you know, under a microscope and seeing what spring it comes from inside these, these mountains that these structures were built on. But there are several of these, and they are astonishing. This is one I want to take a few minutes to describe to you, because it shows you how things change over time. So this is at the base of Oliente Tambo. I was walking around, it was almost dusk, so I barely got this picture. These are two identical uh, 
um, aqueducts that come out from deep within the mountain and drop out into this what was a solid base cut out stone. This was one major stone cut out with a bathtub like structure to it and in the base of it it had two reliefs of perfectly four shaped pyramids and where the water came out it hit these stone pyramids which were reliefs from the floor up of this solid I'll call it a bathtub for a lack of a better descriptive term. And then this whole thing drained out of the side corner. So I took this picture in 2004, astonished that I saw pyramids. I saw three or four of them at Oyentatambo like this, but this was the only one, a pair of two of them. And it was very interesting that they, they, you know, I kind of felt like there's some kind of resonance going on here. And there's some kind of charging going on with the pyramids or something. I, I didn't know what, but I was fascinated. Here's a close-up picture of these pyramids, and this is all solid stone. I literally put my hand down and felt it. Um, and here's another picture of it, of one of them by itself with the water hitting it. So the pyramid sat above the water line. It was kind of designed that the water would run out. I imagine in heavy rains or, you know, different times of year, maybe there was more water coming in there. I'm not sure. But there was a small round drain hole, so these pyramids sat up above the level of the water. Let's go forward. Now this is a picture I took in 2012. I came back to discover the bottom floor was cut apart, the pyramids were gone. And this was just a series of flat stones put in here and the water level was kind of higher. So they dug down, took the base out of this, and someone took the pyramids. Who took them? I don't know. I tried to get Brian Forrester's wife to discuss with the Oleante Tambo entrance guard what happened and he, you know, it's like, no answer. Didn't even know what I was talking about. Then they said, no, no, they were never there. There were no pyramids there. And that's a little video I took of it. In my astonishment that they were gone, I was like, what the heck? And it's the same stone because you can see the same crack in it. So this is just what the mountain looks around it. Like, look at this unusual stone, just slid down from above. You see all these cutouts in the wall behind you where stone, solid stone was cut out. And how the heck did they do that? Because they had to cut the back wall and they had to cut in and down the back wall to take out a piece of stone. I don't think that stone came from there, but you know, you see evidence where the stone was taken from. This is Inca construction. Stones like that is pre-Columbian. Now, this is one more that still exists with a pyramid. This is right at the base of Oleantitambo. Right when you walk through the, the gate, you can walk over to see this. And look at how articulate this is. This waterfall is kind of set up in this base that is here. This is created with a couple of stones together. And of course, it drains out. Really quite fascinating. This is another uh, piece at Oliente Tambo. And what I'm showing you here, this is from a magazine, not one of my pictures, because I was not there on the Vernal Equinox. But you see these, these like reliefs, um, round, like what look like pipes or dowels coming out from the stone, but they are stone and they are relief carved on it and they create shadows. Now on the Vernal Equinox, what happens is the shadow fills these grooves. There was probably a groove here too that this shadow fit and uh, the stone was either taken away or broken through um, some kind of uh, earthquake we don't know but you see things like this again and again in Peru now we're moving on to the last site that I'll be discussing for you and we'll see how I'm doing on time 19 minutes so that I'm good so this is Machu Picchu as it was found in 1913 by the explorer Hiram Bingham who was a British explorer he had gone to Peru and the only reason he discovered this is there had been a lightning strike and quite a significant fire. And the fire had burnt through the overbrush, exposing this so it was visual. Now the local Incas who live along the Inca Trail, and there are still small indigenous groups that, that live along 
along the Inca Trail and live in a, in a town right below this, which is called um, the Hot Springs. I forget what it is in Spanish. I'll think of it in a minute. But there's a, a cute little town at the base of this uh, Machu Picchu where everyone goes and stays if you're going to visit Machu Picchu. So local people told him about this, and uh, they took him there. And he was able to actually see it with some perspective, and it wasn't completely overgrown because of a fire. And um, he, uh, that's when it started to become explored. So this is one of the first and rare pictures. But you can see major structures, which I'm going to point out to you. This one here and this one here. This is called a, um, uh, I think, the... Uh, the Church of the Sun or the Temple of the Sun and this is called the three, the Wall of the Three Sisters or the Three Walls and up here is the Hitching Post of the Sun. Um, so we'll go forward. This is what it looks like today, almost looking at it from the same perspective. And I'm going to talk about three major structures. This one here, the Hitching Post of the Sun, and a church structure, which you can't see too well, but it's got a rounded wall here. So these are megalithic structures. Oh, I, I actually put in arrows for you. Look at that. It's been a while since I looked at this presentation, so... <laughs> Uh, wall, the three walls and the temple of the sun there they're pointed for you I forgot I did that so this artist who uh, did drawings and depictions and to say, stating that each sacred site in Israel was an animal he believes that Peru or Machu Picchu here was actually an alligator so I'll just go back one for you looking at the structure which he lays out. He also believes there's the face of a wolf in the uh, Wainu Pichu behind it. So, whoops, okay. I'll, I'll continue to go forward now. I didn't realize I was going in reverse. So, very interesting alligator. Potentially, this would be the alligator if it is, in fact, an alligator. We don't know. But we'll start looking at some of the megalithic structures. So while you're walking around the top of Peru, you see stones like this at, in Machu Picchu laid out all over. You see them at actually many, many sites. The, this layer of stone put on top of this layer of stone would create like a water pipe um, or a small aqueduct. So many of these are available for site. And this is probably an original stepping stone or, or entrance stone into a structure or some part of a stairway that came apart in some earthquake. This here is Inca architecture. So the Incas lived at the top of Machu Picchu and it was a sacred site for them and they did farming up there, but it is a pre-Columbian or pre-civilization structures were there when the Incas got there. So this is one of the largest temple plazas at the top of Machu Picchu. And this is one solid stone right here. Just to give you a sense, three stones next to it, holding it in place with this extra stone that's here. So your base stones are huge and megalithic. This is one solid base stone here. It's incredible. And again, I'm sure you can see the proportion or size of the stone construction. It gets smaller here, smaller here, or smaller at the top. Again, you have these series of very interesting window structures, but they're not windows. They're not open. What purpose do they serve? It's unclear. This is an example of earthquake. This is way high at the top of the mountain. You can see how these stones were kind of jiggled apart, but the whole structure is still standing, which is amazing. So this is one solid stone base here. And interestingly, this kind of has like a cutout in it, a relief cutout. You see that again and again. Here you can see the relief cutout behind me. Uh, with my good friend who traveled with me. She's a Sitchinite, and she and I studied a lot of work with Zechariah Sitchin, and he wrote extensively about uh, Peru, so we went there together. Um, again, you see the size and structures of these uh, stones getting smaller and smaller. This is the third wall going around. So we looked at this back wall, we looked at the other side, and this is the third side. Again, you can see the base stone, how large it is. 
going forward. Now, there's, th there's three windows that sit over here, and I'm going to show them next to you, I believe. Okay, this, this, is, uh, this is walking around the, uh, this structure with three walls, and you can see this base stone here and the wall that goes back, and then there's a little temple behind here. Uh, also beveled edges everywhere. Here's again a look at the three walls, and we were walking down that pathway in the last picture, and I was showing you the outside of that wall. This is Inca architecture. This is pre-Columbian architecture. Um, this is a picture from Hiram Bingham, and I'm showing you this three-walled structure here from the ancient uh, picture of Hiram Bingham in 1911. And you can see that the earthquake had already happened by 1911. That's the point of that slide. <laughs> and here I'm showing you these. the next thing um, we're going to look at, which is called the three windows, I, I think. Yep, that's just the earthquake evidence. Here is the three windows. Now, interestingly enough, these three windows, you could look out and see down into the Orobamba River Valley. Let's see, how am I doing? It says I have 12 minutes, Peter. Hopefully I do. Um, these are looking at these three structures again. You notice the shape? Very interesting, wider at the bottom, narrower at the top. And this one is a non-window. What purpose does that serve? We don't know. This is looking from the outside of that wall. And I want you to note where these X's are. Look at this large cornerstone again. You see how large these stone structures are. And you're way up top, you know, you're like 7,000 feet in the air here. This cornerstone, again, is carved. It's put in place and then maybe carved in place to curve and fit together. This is the Temple of the Sun. Very interesting alignment happens on the morning of the vernal equinox. The sun comes across through this doorway and makes a straight line across here. Interestingly, it originally was carved with an arc or an, um, a cutout, a point in the top of this stone. And the archaeologists in Peru filled it in with cement because they thought it would crack. But if they hadn't filled it in, you would get a straight line and then a widening, 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 widening line across that base floor of this temple when the sun came up on the vernal equinox. This is what it looks like from below, and this is where the concrete was filled in at the top of that stone. And this is all built on top of this base, right? Which is really quite stunning. This is a quick little video I think I made scrolling down underneath the Temple of the Sun, which is all carved out with some steps, and it's like a little meditation center in there. We don't know what purpose it serves, but look at this structure here to hold everything up in place. It's just bizarre. You kind of think you're on an acid trip or you're a, in a uh, you know, when you're looking at this stuff, you're going, is this really what I'm seeing? So this is a split screen right here. I've given you two visuals of the Temple of the Sun. This is sort of looking at it from above, the rounded curved wall. The sun comes through, goes across, and this is looking at it from underneath, from the side view. Pretty amazing. Now, right at the Temple of the Sun, you have one of these water aqueducts that comes down and then drains through this hole. Look at these stone structure walls at the top of Machu Picchu. That's an Inca stone construction back here. This is pre-Columbian. And then this is some more enormous stone structures. This is the hitching post of the sun. On the vernal equinox, when the sun comes up, it seems to sit. If you're, say, down in the, the plaza, the sun comes up and almost sits right on top of this structure. It's a very weird cut. All of these different points and marks on it have different alignments for different seasons. And this creates a shadow across the top of Machu Picchu as well, across, across that major um, plaza, green grassy area at the top of Machu Picchu. So it's known as the hitching post of the sun because the sun seems to sit on it, but what other purpose it serves is still beyond our understanding today. 
And again, there are no guardrails here. So if you tumble, it's goodbye. Goodbye. And it can be, let me tell you, it's scary because you can easily, have you ever backed up into somebody at a museum and knocked into them or your backpack hits them? And, and I'm standing there with a camera. I'm not even looking at who's around me. You, you have to, um, you know, take a deep breath. More earthquake, evidence of earthquake damage here. But originally, these stones fit perfectly together. And that's where I'm going to stop. I don't know if I have any time for questions. I'm happy to. Yes, go ahead. You're the, yes, you in the black. You said the earthquake round stones? Well, oh, okay, yes. Um, I think they just went into a basement because they wanted to do a different display at the Cori Concha. The, those were on the wall when I was there in 2004 with a little description, both in English and German and I think Spanish, that these were found under one of the, the, the original Cori Concha structures, but they had to kind of take that apart to build this museum. So they moved some of those stones, and when they did, they found these rounded stones underneath the structure. So they figured out that most likely, just like in Japan today, they will build mega structures on top of huge, rounded, rolling casters so that the building will, will roll in an earthquake. So they probably took those rounded stones and put them in the basement of the museum or a storage. How big? Like this? You could hold them? Yeah, they're, they're a version of ball bearings, absolutely. Yes, uh, over here with the blue shirt, and then we'll move to you. Good question. From what we know from the Franciscan priests, no, the Incas did not kill the pre-Columbian culture. There were a series of cultures and tribes that gradually united into the two Inca kings that the Franciscan priests wrote about. Their history was probably about five to six hundred years old at the time when the Spanish conquistadors came onto the scene. But they did not know who were the original founders because they really didn't have a written language. There wasn't a lot that was transferred over to them. But I can tell you, um, Brian Forrester and a number of other researchers like Hugh Newman and whatnot have noted that there are certain artifacts which have been found that show evidence of Sumerian culture, like Sumerian cuneiform writing on a bowl, along with other forms of writing, almost like a Rosetta Stone. There's been a bowl found in Bolivia in a farmer's garden, and um, it's got cuneiform, and it, it talks about farming. Um, it's almost like a bowl for seeds or something. But the fact that there's cuneiform found there suggests to me that some of the early builders of this culture may go back to four, five, six thousand BC. Um, or it could be much earlier. Many people have been dowsing. I myself have been dowsing. I doused when I was in Pumapuca to find out when the structures, I mean, if you've ever been to Bolivia and Pumapuca, you know that it, there's obviously some kind of cataclysmic event that happened that destroyed some of the structures of Pumapuca. And there's more big, huge, you know, unusual stones like I was showing you in Peru. And the dowsing date that I got, and I don't know if I'm that good of a dowser or not. I found water lines under my driveway and things like that. I found things when people are missing them, uh, figuring out where they were. But I got 55,000 BC at the point of the destruction. I didn't have time to keep going further back because in dowsing, you can only ask a yes or no question, right? It's got to be very clear, yes or no. So I was going back in thousands of years and decades, and I got to 55,000 and told I was late for the bus. And that's where that ended, you know? So, But I figured it was more powerful to be there with my foot literally on the stone dowsing. So, but we, we really don't know. But I will tell you that there are structures like this in Easter Island. 
There are structures like this in um, Romania. And um, even in Italy, there is a, a, a mega complex. I forget exactly where it is. There was a big battle that took place here, too, but Hugh Newman has told me about it. And its base structure, of course, it's, you know, the Romans built on top of it, and then other people built on top of that, but its base structure looks like some of these walls we're looking at at Saxawama. You know, it's, it's, it's a megalithic structure. Also in Greece, just behind, uh, you know, where Athens is, there are some terraced step-up walls with walls like this. So until we begin to really understand history and architecture as a science, uh, and until archaeologists begin to respect that, we really don't have a knowledge. Uh, with this lady over here, then I'll jump to you. Go ahead. repeat your question so people could hear. Did I hear any kind of, feel any kind of energy when I was there? Certainly at Oliente Tambo, while I was looking at these two pyramids and the water crashing down on them in 2004, I was stunned. I just uh, stood there stunned in my tracks. And then, of course, I was equally stunned to discover the pyramids were gone. Um, Peru is very feminine energy, very, very high feminine energy, and a very sacred energy. So there's a lots of times you're in Peru, and you're just overwhelmed with this um, sense of compassion and empathy for uh, like the remnants of the culture that's left behind. So I will say that I felt that. Um, I don't really put myself out there as a channeler or a psychic or anything like that, but uh, definitely I was very moved and a, a lot of other people were too. So, and your question? Well, I read So the question, the question was about Zachariah Sitchin's work. He was a uh, Sumerian scholar, and he translated Sumerian text and history and cuneiform writing, identifying that it most likely was a form of accurate history. And he wrote many books um, talking about history of civilization, history of kings and rulers, and history of structures and ancient sites on the planet. So the question referred to is, do any current academics and scholars and historians take his work seriously because his work was often dismissed or if you go into a bookstore you would find it under the paranormal section you know rather than under the historical section so unfortunately no a lot of people don't because there were times in Zechariah's writing where he did uh, he made correlations that were maybe loosely founded he would say because of this then that makes sense some of his correlations I think were brilliant other times he kind of took liberties that maybe he shouldn't have. Um, but he made correlations to, say, the number 12 and the 12 decimal counting system and the way we keep time today and many ancient structures like Stonehenge all on the base of 12. Um, I think he really contributed quite a lot to various pieces of history we don't understand. And I really read and respected his work, and I think it has keys and clues. But when I was traveling with Robert Chalk, he would dismiss Zechariah's work. So, no, his work is not really uh, yet fit into the proper place in history where it belongs. Is that it for time? Okay, thank you very much.